Hey, it's time to have a healthy look at your Google My Business. Local search is huge, and your GMB is right dead center in the middle of it. Have you gone through your GMB workout routine? You need some help improving your site visibility? Well, we're going to go through the seven top optimization steps for your GMB today on The Edge. Your weekly digital marketing trends with industry trend-setting guests. You're listening and watching Edge of the Web. Winners of Best Podcast from the Content Marketing Institute for 2017. Here at see more at edgeofthewebradio.com. Now, here's your host, Aaron Sparks. All right. Hey, uh, well, this is Edge of the Web Radio, episode 344. I'm your host, Aaron Sparks. Uh, every week we bring you amazing uh, guests to chat with and kind of unpack digital marketing trends and news. Uh, every week we actually uh, do a deep dive with uh, different concepts with our digital marketing audience, whether you are part of an agency or part of a firm that has a marketing department or a freelancer, this show is for you. So we want to check out all the uh, re uh, recent shows over at Edge of the Web Radio.com. That's Edge of the Web Radio.com. If you're new to the show, welcome. Great to have you on board. Uh, let's show you the ropes real quick. Every show uh, that we start off with is live on YouTube at 3 p.m. Eastern. Um, and uh, from there, we actually break off our YouTube videos and, and video into uh, Facebook content and other uh, errant video platforms. We also take our, uh, our audio, take it to iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, iHeartMedia, Spotify, all the uh, podcast aggregators. And if we're not where you usually listen to your podcast, let us know. We'll certainly get our content there. And then we actually take everything, take it to transcripts, go into vlog content, social media content and the like. So we are, we are moving mightily uh, content on a regular basis into the digital omni-channel new media space. How about those for buzzwords for you? Uh, the Edge, Edge of the Web is actually brought to you by our title sponsor, Site Strategics. They're uh, an agile digital marketing firm located in Indianapolis, Indiana, pioneers in the agile marketing methodology. We focus on SEO, technical SEO, social media management, social media marketing, search engine marketing, conversion rate optimization, website development, and much more, including email marketing and the like. We you build an app every once in a while as well. So if you're interested in results-based marketing on the digital front that actually work, that's what Agile is, literally shifting and changing based on results. Who knew? Go over to uh, sitestrategics.com and uh, connect with us. We'll be happy to sit down, talk with you for an hour or so, and, and unpack some digital marketing tactics towards your success. And if there's a relationship there, who knows? You might be able to, to, to connect with us, and we can, we can march ahead into building better and better digital marketing ROI. All right. I'm going to invite the team on board here. They, they just came back from SMX, and boy, are our arms tired. Well, not really. At one point, I thought we were going to take a bus back from Seattle. Oh my gosh! So, so here, here's here, here's the thing: is that literally, you we're on one plane that has to be rebooted twice. We're in dead silence. I mean, there is darkness on the plane, and they're telling us that they are doing some software corrections, and just like you're actually powering down your phone, right? <laughs> Praying, <laughs> you don't have to do a hard boot. So there's one, and and then and, and to be clear, this is while we're still on the ground. Yes. <laughs> we're able to open the yeah. doors and let air go through. This is Mid flight. Hey guys, we're going to reboot the computer. Off. Yeah. And then we also, on the way back, we get ferried out to a gangplank that's three stories high onto the tarmac of a plane uh, on uh, in uh, the uh, Seattle airport. So yeah. they don't, they didn't build a big a, a building big enough to have, yeah. house all their planes, I guess. That was my first experience with that. Yeah. So all the terminal we were in was nothing but buses. Yeah. From Seattle to Indiana, it's kind of scary. But. Yeah, well, we certainly appreciate uh, uh, the the partnership with Third Door Media. They had us out as media partners. We got a lot of really good footage of different uh, exhibitors as well as uh, speakers out at the engagement. And uh, I think we, we're having a good relationship there. We're going to be putting forth some of the content from, uh, from that show as well as working with SMX and Third Door in the future. So you may very well see us out at SMX Advanced in June to be able to uh, possibly do some live streaming out there as well. I think we got a really good gander at uh, what we could do with uh, the Third Door team, and they're excited about this next level that we could possibly bring to SMX. What are your thoughts about the about the entire conference, guys? Um, I had a great time. I was exhausted, uh, <laughs> you know, and we were doing uh, we were doing the various tracks. We were doing uh, doing our own thing as well, but um, it was neat as a team to be able to sit down and, and split up the tracks and decide this is good for the group yep. or 
there are three things here that are good for the group or you know whatever it was just nice to be able to split up and then get back together and not be uh, locked into any one specific thing like you right. could really bounce all over the place or you could be laser focused on just one area uh, whatever works for your team yep Allie, what do you think well, I had my whole schedule of all my tracks, and I never even followed my schedule. Oh, yeah. I mean, you were well organized, and we broke that apart like a like a like a trying to solve a Rubik's cube. You know? I know. Bash. I almost want to go back and update my calendar of what I <laughs> where you were. Yeah. <laughs> no, that was some really good information out there. So we applaud all of the speakers at SMX. They did a fantastic job. Uh, those slide decks are forthcoming. They're all popping all over the place. Be sure to check those out. And we certainly do recommend you go out to SMX Advanced and uh, that you gotta check out the West and the East because they're really rolling through some great information on a regular basis. All right, so for what we're doing here on the show, some housekeeping notes. Uh, I guess they're upcoming here very soon. Chuck Fields, we're going to be talking about podcasting SEO on the 2nd of March. Brittany M Muller from Moz is actually on the 9th. That'll be a bang-up show. J.D. Prater from Quora uh, PPC is on the 16th. Aaron Levy of Tenuity is on the 23rd. Amy Bishop is going to be talking to us on PPC uh, regard on the 30th of March. And then we have J John Henshaw coming back around to us on the 6th of April. We're talking Koi Wolf and everything that he gets freaked out about. So that's always, always a fun show. So there's a good lineup there. Check over at Edge of the Web Podcast, Edge of the Web, <laughs> Edge of the Web Radio dot com on a regular basis to get updated on the on the upcoming shows. We keep that fresh on the line, on the line. It's on the line. If you're interested in being part of the show, or if you know someone who wants to jump in here and have uh, shoot the shoot the proverbial uh, uh, stuff with us on digital marketing, let us know. Go over to uh, and just email to info at sitestrategics.com. Nope, info at edgeofthewebradio.com. Always do that. <laughs> Just email us everywhere. A email us at all the spaces, and we'll be certainly uh, reaching out to you and see what we can do to get you on the show. Set your reminders on YouTube and make sure that you get notified whenever we go live at 3 p.m. Uh, Eastern every Monday. All right, last bit of news, uh, last bit of information. Edge fans, we are honestly wanting to have your feedback on our site. Uh, let us know what you want to hear from us on the show. Uh, if it's advanced SEO, if it's more social media focused, if it's local search like we're going to be talking about today, if there's any topics that we are not touching uh, or you haven't heard us recently, let us know. Uh, we are, we're trying to pull our audience and get some good information. We've got a lot of good responses for what you want to see in 2020. So just go over to edgeofthewebradio.com. There's a poll right there. Anonymous. We won't use it for anything else except just making sure that we're giving you the, the, the best show content possible. So go check it out over at edgeofthewebradio.com. All right, we're now going to pivot around and be sure that you actually check out our news item, uh, our news breakdown of the show with Sherry Bonnelly uh, coming up uh, in a little while right after this. But for now, let's deep dive with this week's featured guest. Now it's time for Edge of the Web featured interview with Sherry Bonelli, owner at Early Bird Digital Marketing. All right, we got Sherry Bonelli in the house. Welcome back, Sherry. It's been two years since you've been on the show. It has been, but I'm happy to be back again. Thank we, you. Oh, we are more than happy to have, have you here. Hey, what you been doing? I've been busy. I have been very busy um, focusing on Google My Business lately. Um, I was recently selected by Google to be a silver product um, Google My Business expert. So that has been keeping me busy. Very good. Very good. Yes, you have. Now, uh, for, for our audience who does not know, Sherry, let's introduce her to you. She's the founder and CEO of Early Bird Digital Marketing and has written a series of articles on search engine land about the benefits of podcasting and how SEOs can use it to help improve their organic presence. And I want to harken back to our old show that we did because we unpacked a lot about podcasting and SEO. And, and we kind of got into a world of inception because we were literally doing our optimization on that show, talking about optimization on podcasts. You got <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> to check that out. So uh, she is a Google My Business silver product expert and a columnist on the leading digital marketing websites like Search Engine Land, Moz, Semrush, Bright Local, Geo Marketing Score, and others. She's also received Search Engine Land's 2018 SEO Contributor of the Year Award, and her local search engine optimization blog posts are among the most shared and read online. So kudos to that. You're also, Sherry, a columnist 
for those those digital marketing websites like SEL, Moz, Samurai, Bright Local Score, all those. Uh, so you're constantly p- pushing out content. You're also a regular speaker at national and local industry events, webinars, and podcasts. I guess you are yeah. kind of busy, aren't yeah. you? I love it. Absolutely. Uh, all right. So for our audience, there's the official bio. Now let, let's hear about the freakiness of, of digital marketing and how you got to be in the space you are. Yeah, it's actually kind of a crazy journey that I had. So I got started doing digital marketing because I started an e-commerce business after my son was born. I invented a baby product and I decided to launch that. And I know I needed a website. It was back in the days, you know, it was like 19... um, 1998. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, there were really no website building tools out there. So my first website was literally crap. And I decided to start selling my product and realized that I needed to add other products to um, my website in order to actually make some money. Mm-hmm. And it was right when PayPal had come out. And so my first e commerce sale was actually a check that I got in the mail. I mean, that's how leery people were about adding credit cards oh, to. Yeah the internet, you know? And so I started on e-commerce and I knew that search engine optimization was a must. I needed to learn how to rank higher. So I basically taught myself all of the search engine optimization strategies that I learn today. Mm -hmm. And it's just amazing how much it's evolved. I mean, back in the day, you know, I was ranking for keywords like pregnancy and, and baby and all of these, you know, basic keywords. Sure. But now, man, it has so changed. I mean, I don't honestly even know if I'd want to get into the e-commerce space right now just <laughs> with how competitive it is. But back then, you know, it was it was very easy to get ranked um, for just those basic keywords. But it really got me started um, with search engine optimization because it was almost like a puzzle to me. Mm-hmm. You know, how do I do this? You know, how do I understand what the search engines are looking for and those types of things. So that's how I got started. And it was a really successful business. Uh, Unfortunately, I had to let it go for personal reasons. And then I decided to just take my expertise and help local businesses. So that's, that's how I got started. Very good. Very good. So you've been doing local optimization for a good number of years. And in that space, you've seen yeah, we all agree that the game has changed completely in national SEO, international SEO, but the yeah. but the local SEO space has just exploded. And with that, Google My Business has truly jumped into a key space of value for for businesses, small, medium, and large business to be able to take hold and connect with consumers even before they reach uh, the, the brand's website. So there's a huge right. Uh, unpacking that I like to do regarding uh, uh, regarding Google My Business is is a it's a huge factor and and you're right there in the the middle of it. So first and foremost, what's it mean to be a silver product expert? Let's let's unpack that real quick. Yeah, sure. So um, being a product expert with Google basically means that Google has a, a support. Um, forum for people that have questions about Google My Business. And so there are volunteers that literally volunteer their time to answer questions about Google My Business. So a lot of business owners will go to the forum Mm -hmm. and say, I've been suspended, I don't know what to do next, or there's a bad review on, you know, a fraudulent review on my website, what do I, on my Google My Business you know, listing, what do I do? Those types of things. And so there are a handful of volunteers that go in there and answer those questions. And what Google does is they keep track of who's answering those questions, how correct those answers are, Mm -hmm. how polite they are, how helpful those answers are. And then several times a year, they go in and select a handful of people who have shown that they've gone above and beyond in answering and helping. So this year I was selected to be a silver product expert. The next level is gold. And then the next level is platinum. And there's very few platinum. There's very few gold. And then there's, you know, a handful of silver product experts. Well, congratulations to that. And how long does it, no, you're more than welcome. How long does it take to actually uh, get that type of, of uh, 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 allocation there? Yeah, I've been working on answering questions for about two years there now. Yeah. So the main trick, if you're interested in, in becoming a product expert, is consistency. Right. So you need to be going in every day and answering questions. So it's not like you can answer a question 
and then leave for two weeks and then answer another question. It really is about consistency. You know, the, the funny thing is it can literally consume your entire day if you let it. So that's the I challenge. Bet. It's kind of like walking away and getting, you know, getting to work on your real clients. But, you know, it really is about answering questions. And, and basically what I've done is I've created a big, huge document of, questions and answers, you know, a resource document about Google My Business so that when people do ask questions, I just go to that document, search for the answer, right. and I'm able to more quickly compose an answer. For so you've kind of made your own uh, personal wiki there. I have a cheat sheet. Yes, there you go. exactly. Well, yeah. That's good. Well, and that, that demonstrates a level of discipline that a lot of marketers don't participate in, but you're also seeing that Google's vetting that content, vetting your answers, and providing that level of, of, of uh, you know, quality to, to you as a, as a professional. So that's fantastic. Yeah. And, and we're certainly going to see you continue to participate to get into those additional levels. Um, so we wanted to bring on the on the show because we haven't talked about GMB for a while. Uh, a, a few shows ago we did, and and it's a constant uh, a drumbeat of things. And and we certainly want to recommend our listeners go to the news articles because we have covered a number of different, uh, very specific local search uh, uh, news briefs. But um, I want to get into what GMB is, and we we wanted to also unpack some optimization techniques. But before anything else. Um, for the users, for the audience that don't know, let's let's talk about maybe small, medium-sized businesses that have mm -hmm. no understanding of what Google My Business is. What does it mean uh, inside of the local in local search? What what is this asset that Google's providing you? Yeah, so Google basically gives you a gives certain businesses that qualify a free listing mm -hmm. on their platform, and to me, that's huge. I mean you know, what better way to get on a search engine, especially Google, which is the largest search engine, yep. than to get a free listing. Now, what business owners need to keep in mind is not all businesses qualify. There are a handful of businesses that do not qualify for Google My Business. Okay. And Google My Business is not an entitlement. You're not owed a Google My Business, you know, listing. Yep. So, you know, People think they deserve it. They've earned it, you know, just because they have a business. Yep. That's not the case, okay? So if you do qualify, you should definitely claim your Google My Business listing. Mm -hmm. But not just claim it. You need to optimize it and you need to keep on it and keep checking it and keep adding to it. Because, you know, there are a lot of people that don't realize, for instance, that anybody can go in there and make suggested changes and actually change information about your listing. Right. And you might not even know it if you're not checking and keeping up on that. So over the years, Google has really made some great enhancements and, and features adding to Google My Business that allows business owners to really create a very robust Google My Business what we call a knowledge panel, mm -hmm. which displays and shows a lot of information about your business, almost so much that people can, customers and searchers can almost make a decision just by looking at your Google My Business knowledge panel right. as to whether or not they even want to do business with you. Exactly. You know, they can see reviews, they can see photos, they can see your business description, your hours of operation. Mm -hmm. You know, they can see so much information that they can almost make a decision right then and there whether or not they even want to call your business, visit your website, or even stop by right. and see what you have to offer. And that's really important is to recognize is that um, there's been a constant uh, um, discussion about um, Google uh, presenting more and more of their assets between you and your customer. Uh, mm -hmm. Your customer is actually interacting with GMB now to a much greater degree. And there are, we'll go through a number of these, these key points, but uh, what, what does it represent uh, to you as a brand? Uh, it, it certainly displays your personality. If you are optimizing, if you are cultivating this property that they have, it also gives a, a, a open environment for consumers to be able to review you directly, which is the 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 consumer reports, so to speak, of mm -hmm. of uh, of the internet. And on top of that, you also have another set of analytics to actually look at those behaviors on that GMB are measurable. You can see traffic to that particular GMB, you can see address navigation, click throughs to the website and calls mm -hmm. all before that consumer even interacts with your own website property. So that's what you're talking about there. This is 
a, a high decision making criteria for consumers to, to evaluate your business as a whole because it's given consumers the ability to to draw their own conclusions and communicate about your brand it's huge right exactly and you know the one thing is google wants users to contribute to your google my business profile mm -hmm. they want that they want that user generated content because those users or your your customers are unbiased Right. Hopefully, you know what I mean? A business is always going to say good things about themselves. But if customers can upload photos, if they can upload reviews and, and ask questions, those that's going to be kind of unbiased information that is going to only benefit other searchers that are looking for information about whether or not they want to do business with that company. Absolutely. I want to make sure that we let our audience know if you want to go live with us every every Monday at 3, make sure you go and hit that bell on our YouTube subscription so you can actually go live with us and ask our guests some questions as well. All right, jumping back into our, our optimization tactics. As we want to, we've got a block of time here we want to break down some key optimization tactics here. Now, for those users who have not acquired their Google My Business, we want to do a quick run through of some of the, of the initial steps that we have to do uh, to be able to grab a hold of this. And then we'll actually get into some deeper uh, optimization execution. So NAP, name, address, and, and uh, uh, phone number accuracy. The first stage of all this is knowing, you know, how how possibly disconnected your nap, your nap is what's the importance of nap when it comes down to local search and especially google my business right um i think over the years um with regard to citation sites or online directories yep. and google which essentially is an you know a citation site the consistency is kind of um not as important as it once was, oh, but it's God. still, but it's still very important. Mm -hmm. I mean, in my opinion, I think you still always want to strive to have your company's name, address, and phone number matched whenever possible. Sure. Now, the challenge is, or or what a lot of businesses don't realize is, Google probably already has your business in their system. Yep. You know, you're probably already there. So if you do a search for your business, mm -hmm. chances are you're already there. You just may not have claimed your profile yet. There it is. And yeah. And so um, the information is probably there. So what I generally tell my customers is if you're going to use a name, address, and phone number, mm -hmm. I usually start with whatever Google has as your address and kind of use that for other online directories. So if a business is just getting started with all of this, mm -hmm. I generally say, what does Google have as your address? Use that on all the other online directories. Even if it's not there. what you've been posting on business cards, kind of steer into the skid, so to speak, right? Yep, yep. That's what I recommend. That's because, a good point. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we we do want to give to our audience one quick thing. Uh, if you want to com if you want to have a look at your nap, uh, you can actually go over. Uh, Sitechecker has a quick uh, analysis tool. If you go to edgeofthewebradio.com forward slash nap, you can actually jump on there, put your information in, and you'll be able to see on all the different citation listings what discrepancies you have out there. And this is nothing but just giving you some information as as an edge listener. Sorry about that. I just as we were talking about this, I wanted to give our audience something that they could at least get a, a feedback loop on. Absolutely. Right. So and, and you're gonna be surprised at the inconsistencies yeah. that you find. You and really and yeah, don't be scared of it, but it does show <laughs> it does show you that these are some key things that could be optimized relatively easily, right? Over, over a period of time to right. kind of centralize and normalize that data uh, that is your, your digital, their digital asset out there. Um, yep. All right, so claiming the business is very easy to go, be able to go you search for the business online, see your information. If you don't have access to it, you can claim that, that information. Now there's a verification process. We've gone mm -hmm. through it before in different aspects on the show, but quickly you give the, it, it, Google gives you the opportunity of clicking on, do you own this business or do you claim this business link on mobile, go through and you go through a request for ownership verification, yep. right? Verification. So how yep. type, what different verification types are there for claiming your business? Yeah, so typically most people are going to um, get the option to receive a postcard in the mail. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason why Google does that is they want to actually verify that the, there is a physical location for that business. Because, and we can probably talk about this later, there's a lot of people that are setting up fake locations and fake businesses. And so what Google wants to do is send a 
postcard to the actual location that you have entered right. as your business and make sure that there's a physical building there that someone's actually going to pick up that mail and then you're going to enter the you know the pin which is a numbers mm -hmm. um, and log back into your Google My Business platform and verify it. Now, what I find on the help forum is a lot of people are saying, I don't get mail at my business hmm. or the post office doesn't deliver to my address. And I'm just blown away by that. To me, I in this day and age, I don't understand, right. especially in the United States, that the post office doesn't deliver to an address. Um, that just maybe they're a moving, me. maybe a roving van. That's what they do their business out of. I just don't get it. <laughs> I mean, I'm just, and they're like, "Well, can you email me? Can you text message me?" I'm like. Right. No, you know, they can't. Now, Google does do that for certain businesses. Sure. We don't really know why or what criteria Google uses mm -hmm. to determine what verification process Google selects for you. But whatever option they give you, that's what you do. You know what I mean? Yep. So, for instance, one of my clients is a landscaper. He had a Google My Business um, profile that was there and it was unclaimed. Mm -hmm. When we went to go claim it, he was one of the lucky ones where he was given the option to receive a text message. Oh, wow. Why? I don't know. But we were like, yes, that's cool. That's now, cool. the unfortunate thing is once he claimed it and we got rid of his home address because he runs his business out of his home, he immediately got suspended. Oh, my. So, you know, I mean, there, you know, stuff like that happens. But he was allowed to verify via text message. But that doesn't happen very often. Most people are going to verify via postcard. Mm -hmm. So you need to wait about seven to 14 days, usually about seven days, you'll receive a postcard. And what I tell people is, let anybody know, whoever's checking the mail at your office, that they're going to receive a postcard. It may look like junk mail mm -hmm. or spam mail. Keep it, let the person Absolutely. know who's, you know, attention and give it to them. So just give everybody a heads up that they should be looking for a, a postcard from Google. Yep. Uh, and uh, just to touch on, but we won't dive into it. They also have some video chat verification, if yep. I'm not mistaken. And yes. there are Google trusted verifiers out there as well that can also assist in some of this navigation, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that program has changed quite a bit. They recently announced announced a change to it. Okay. So that program now um, is a, agencies cannot belong to that that program. It's meant for larger organizations like Chamber of Commerces. Oh. Um, Score, for instance. I don't know if you're familiar with Score, but I'm a Score mentor, mm -hmm. and Score organizations or local Score chapters they can be um, instant verifiers as well. Oh, very cool. I, mean, I can't remember how they renamed the program. So for instance, as a SCORE mentor, I can go ahead and verify people mm -hmm. on the spot pretty much. Um, but you know, that's really meant for larger organizations that deal with a bunch of businesses. And it's primarily meant for those company or those organizations that do training Got on it. Google Maps. Yeah. So we're going to send all of our verification qu requests over to Sherry, and you'll take care of all that, right? <laughs> yeah, no. All right. <laughs> all right. So with that, um, quickly also want to re reference that uh, you want to claim, as you claim that, you want to also verify your business account and claim the uh, short name for your business. Briefly, what is the short name when it comes down to GMB? Yeah, so a short name is almost like a handle, almost mm -hmm. like a Twitter handle or, um, you know, a, basically a short name for your business. So in the past, if you wanted to have someone leave a review for you, for instance, you would have to say, go to Google, enter in my business name and address, the knowledge panel will show up, mm -hmm. look at that, click on the review button and leave me a review. You know, the short names allow you to basically say, um, go to G dot page and then enter your short name forward slash review. And then people, when they enter that URL, it's going to automatically pop up a place for them to leave a review for your business. And likewise, if they enter that URL G dot, I think it's page and then your short name, it's going to bring people directly yep. to your knowledge panel. And so it's just a, an easy way for people to direct their customers to leave reviews and yep. hopefully for other things as well. Now, short names, it doesn't matter if you use hyphens. I think I was probably one of the first people to kind of notice that hyphens didn't matter. Oh, really? uh, I remember talking to Ben Fisher and I'm like, 
I'm entering hyphens and they both go to my page. Is that supposed to work? And we were discussing whether or not that was a bug or not. And it's, not a bug. So, you know, people were thinking that you could get hyphenated short names and mm-hmm. non-hyphenated short names. The hyphens don't matter. Okay. So if you get digital marketer, one word, you also get digital dash marketer as well. So um, generally what you want to do is pick an, a name that's close to your business name yep. or something that describes what your business does. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So that, that's always useful, and you can always put that on your business cards as well. And now, you can change your short name, I think, um, up to two times, two or three times per year. Mm-hmm. But know that, you know, once you do that, your other short name kind of goes into the pool so somebody else can take it as well. Oh, really? So it's almost like the domain name. Yeah, you got to squat on it. You got to squat on it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All righty. So a little bit further here. Now we're actually getting into a little bit more optimization. That's a great optimization technique. But on top of that, we also have to write the perfect business description. Now, in our news uh, uh, this, this week, we all we are talking about uh, the fact that uh, Google's actually kind of weighing both sides of the fence when it comes to do descriptions actually weigh into your optimization. But uh, we do want to focus on this because this is a critical thing. There's 750 yep. character description for your GMB profile. What should be in there, Sherry? When you write a description, um, you definitely don't want to keyword stuff it because first of all, that sounds clunky. It sounds awkward. Yep. And you know, customers don't want to read about that. You do want to include your city and your state just because people want to know where you're physically located, especially, you know, your local business. So they want to know whether or not you're in Hiawatha, Iowa, or whether you're in Marion, Iowa, they want to know how far they have to drive to get to you. Or if you're a service area business, you may want to mention some of the service areas that you will drive to. So, you know, if you're willing to drive 25 miles, you may want to mention that you service areas like Iowa City, Coralville, um, you know, and and maybe Eli, for mm-hmm. instance. Mm-hmm. But what you really want to do is tell the customers or potential customers what your business does, right. the products and services that you sell, and you know, to me, don't waste those characters with we're a business that's locally owned and operated and have been in the family for fifty plus years. You know, those types of things. Um, I don't think matter as much Mm -hmm. to people anymore. Mm -hmm. You really want to use those 750 characters wisely Mm -hmm. by, um, you know, showing your experience, why they should actually buy from you, why they should spend time looking at your website or actually coming in and doing business with you. So really sell what you do and, you know, use it as a selling feature as to why people should spend time thinking about you and why they should do business with you. So it's really important that you spend time thinking about it. Now, the other thing is Google will review your business description. So you could get your business description rejected as well. So just know that Google will look at that. So what happens whenever it gets rejected though? You'd have to rewrite it. Okay. Okay. So it's not one and gone. Yeah. I mean, you're going to be able to uh, rehash that. Resubmit it. Yeah. But don't ever use it as promotional. Like don't say come in for 50% off on this item. Don't ever use it as a promotional thing because right. that will definitely not go well with Google. Yeah, is, it, there's a, is there a flag that happens if you're rewriting your description all the time? Um, no, no, there's no flag. But um, generally speaking, uh, if you are to sit down in general and make a whole bunch of changes at mm-hmm. one sitting, that can trigger a suspension. There you go. All righty. So... so yeah. The the uh, by the way, just as a as a side note, all these GMBs do have the ability to be suspended if you uh, abuse the system, and right. you've seen them time and time again. Things that are just are are poorly executed, or you're, you're not verifying correctly, and it disappears right. out of the space. All right. So uh, continue down our road of optimization. Now these are basic setups, but we also want to make make sure we're spending time on these these before we go to a little bit more advanced. And I want to be respectful of time, uh, choosing the appropriate category and subcategory. As you expect, categories are, are key to optimizing a Google My Business and plays a very important place in uh, local search ranking that tells, that tells Google where searchers, <laughs> where searchers should be finding your business and what you're relevant for. So this is probably a pillar of the optimization. Lay it on us. What should we be paying attention to and what should we avoid? 
Yeah. So the primary category should be the best category that matches what your business does. Mm -hmm. And then you can include secondary categories. And I generally tell people like, don't go overboard on picking a ton of secondary categories. I think if you pick maybe two or three, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Now the challenge is, for instance, if you are a practitioner, if you have an office with practitioners, that's where it gets a little bit tricky. So let's say you're a law firm and your law practice has um, divorce attorneys, for instance. Mm -hmm. If you have all of your practitioners that also select divorce attorneys, chances are either your office or the practitioners are going to get filtered out because Google's not going to want to show all of those attorneys with the exact same name, address, and phone number. Right. So what you may want to do is think of a strategy where some of those attorneys maybe pick a specialty. So maybe one of them is family law. The other one is, you know, divorce is their primary category. Right. So when it comes to practitioners, it gets a little bit more tricky where you might want to select different primary categories for some of those attorneys, for instance, or dentists or chiropractors or whatever. But you generally want to pick categories that are very specific to what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Now, the other thing is you can change categories and Google's always adding new categories as well. So you want to frequently go in and check to see if there's new categories that better describe what your business is about. Uh, is there and, any master list that keeps on getting updated regarding those categories? Yeah. I mean, um, there is a list. Um, it's Plepper, I think is how you pronounce it, mm -hmm. that has a list. And I can go ahead and send it over to you so you can put it in the show notes. Absolutely. No, that'd be fantastic. Keeping a, just uh, aware of changing because we all have been there for, for advertisers and marketers have actually done this. Where's my category? And right. earlier, I mean, years ago, I mean, there was a lot of categories that didn't exist that <laughs> should have made perfect sense that they would. So, right. you know, you do need to, uh, as a regular basis, as marketers, go back through that list because you better believe that it's probably appeared at some point in time and you need to reset that to your clients that you're working with. Um, all right. So uh, regarding that, let's, let's move a little bit more further into the optimization here when it comes down to tracking and destination URLs. Do you recommend a call tracking number in GMB? So there, if, if you are anal about tracking everything, which <laughs> some customers are and some customers are not, right. You, you can. So just keep in mind that if you do use a tracking number as your primary phone number, right. that's going to mess up your nap, right? Um, at least your, your main phone number. Um, so if you're using a tracking phone number, for instance, go ahead and use that as your primary number, but then make sure that your secondary number matches the online directories. Perfect. Okay. Yep. And matches your website. So you want to make sure those are consistent. The other thing is, um, for instance, CallRail mm -hmm. allows you to use their tool to add a tracking number. They can connect to Google My Business, for instance, right. and can add it. Don't ever add third part. Don't ever let third party tools access your Google My Business. Oh, platform. okay. There's yeah. a big ray flow. Now, just unpack that quickly for me. Why? Yeah, because third party tools have been known to trigger suspensions. And we're not exactly sure why, but it happens quite a bit. Okay. And so we just recommend people steer clear of connecting any third-party tool directly with your Google My Business platform. Google AdWords so, not included, though, obviously. Right, exactly. Right. Yep, yep. Okay. So, you know, if I, for instance, I have a lawyer who's a, a client of mine, and they wanted to add a tracking number, and so they sent me information regarding adding you know, connecting call rail. And I said, mm -hmm. you know, I'll manually add the phone number. I'm not connecting call rail to your Google My Business platform. Got I it. don't want this triggering a suspension. And I, you know, I actually reached out to some platinum product experts as well. And they said the same thing. Huh. Don't, don't do it. Understood. So. All right. So from a tracking standpoint as well, you want to make sure that any option that is available for you in the GMB, you want to fill out. Now, all has to do with the type of categories of business that you're in, but making sure that all of their all the options are available for putting in a web URL. So exact, yeah, you're, 
you obviously have to have these live URLs. You can't put in something that's not actually active, but making sure right. you have your homepage in there. If you take appointments, your appointment URL. If yeah. you are a restaurant, having your menu URL, as well as if you're taking bookings or orderings, having those URLs, mm -hmm. those things are all customizable inside of GMB as you categorize yourself, right? Right. And, and make sure that none of those URL are redirects. Okay. So that's another tip. All right. So what about UTMs in those, re uh, those URLs as well? Yes, you can use UTMs, mm -hmm. and that way you can track um, in Google Analytics uh, that those are coming from Google My Business. Excellent. Excellent. Now, what you want to do, though, is make sure you come up with, you know, a pattern to make sure that you know whether it's coming from a post or whether it's coming from the knowledge panel mm -hmm. or whether it's coming from oh. something. So just make sure that you write down some sort of standard UTM, you know, pattern that you're going to be using for yep. those types of links. All right, so there's a lot more into that area that you can you can dive into. Yeah. Um, but let's jump into another level, and that's the services, the menus, and the products section of GMB. And mm -hmm. there's only there's a, there's only available to these are only, services are only available to a few types of service businesses like de den dentists, attorneys, a, uh, insurance agents, hotels, marketing agencies, and such. Um, it only shows up for the end users in the Google Maps app right now. Is that correct? Um, the services can show up on desktop, I believe, okay. as well. Um, but that you're correct. They do show up for only certain categories. Mm -hmm. And so if you do not have them showing up, you can try changing your main category and see if it shows up then. Yeah, shake out these so, additional services. Okay, cool. Yep, yep. So, so if you're not getting them and you want to show services or products, mm -hmm. try changing your main category and see if you're then given that option. So you can also create separate sections for different categories of services you offer as well. So it is it does kind of unfold for you, right? Yes, it does. It does. But we've not found, the industry has not found that that impacts rankings at all. So okay. it's generally meant for just consumer Trans benefit. Transactional, getting people to where they're looking to, to, to reach. Um, right, so they can see what you have to offer. Now, what about the description of each service? Does that have any bearing or is that the same thing? Is that you're not seeing any type of additional optimization? Yeah, no additional optimization benefits from right. that. But again, it, it just gives the customer or potential customer more information about what you have to offer. Well, I mean, so. if, if, you're, if you're a restaurant and, and Google My Business provides you menus, you can actually have sep separate sections for each of your menus as well as menu items for each section. Now, that's a very robust feature, especially if you're interacting with people out of mobile space. They're looking at the menu, the actual unfolding menu on a GMB. Uh, and those can also have destination URLs as well, correct? Yep. Yes. And, and you know, that's the benefit. I mean, and that's why, you know, I kind of consider that Google My Business really wants to, I think Google wants people to stay. Oh, yeah on google for as long as possible it's a foregone google conclusion <laughs> they, yeah they're not they're not trying to get you to go to the to your website anymore they want you to stay where you're at yep no yep. They, they do and but i mean if you're playing with their sandbox right um they're going to be able to be they're going to be benefiting you and if you're actually yep. uh, uh, this indirect optimization it's not just content on on a particular service yeah you're not going to get that bump but utilizing all the features to the to the nth degree that google allows you to there's got to be some factors of local improvement there as yes. you as you unfold all that so there are yeah very good so um products themselves each have can fall have you can have separate products under each category of products and um, can you tell me a little bit about business defined attributes so attributes are basically, they, again, are dependent on categories. So mm -hmm. some categories will get different attributes. So for instance, you, most businesses will see the, the attribute of women-led business or, okay. you know, um, veteran-owned businesses. Or bus you, businesses led by a guy with a girl's name, something like exactly, that. Exactly. Right? Okay, those types of things. Yeah. <laughs> so if you are if you are such a business, you can click on that mm -hmm. and that will show up. You know, Very the cool. funny thing is if you're a women-owned business, you sometimes will get a little badge on um, a mobile device that says that you're kind of a recommended vendor, hmm. you know, which is kind of cool. Um but depending on your category, you are given other attributes gotcha. to choose from. So restaurants get different attributes, like they may have, you know, a great, great beer selection attribute. Mm -hmm. 
you know, or outside dining attribute. So it just depends on your category. Yep. Um, so you want to make sure that you're, you know, constantly selecting the right ones for you, but also checking because again, just like categories, Google is always adding more attributes as well. And they also take attributes away and they also take categories away too. Oh my so, gosh. All right. So always keep checking. <laughs> so always be checking. Always be checking. And and would you recommend a level? How, how do you go about auditing that? Uh, except for just going into each and every GMB and down to the nth degree. Is there any key factors or, or things that you should be paying attention to to make this a, a quicker audit? Because I mean, you can go down the rabbit hole uh, a pretty pretty long yeah. ways, right? Yeah, it can. I mean, when you do, generally, like when you do a search, right. you, it's pretty easy to see. Like if you're a realtor, you know, you search real estate agent or realtor, you can generally see which categories are there for you. Okay. Um, so, you know, it's, it's pretty easy to see, but um, you know, the, the tool that I'm going to give to you so you can put it in the show notes, mm -hmm. you know, that gives you a pretty long list of the ones that are available. Very good. Uh, conversely, what are subject uh, user defined attributes? So those are ones where the cut, where the end users can actually go in and, and, pick an attribute. Mm -hmm. So for instance, that is where Google wants end users opinion about a business. So for instance, they may be given the option to select whether or not the restaurant is a cozy restaurant okay, or whether or not they serve appetizers or whether or not they have happy hours. Got so it. those are ones where consumers get to choose an attribute for that business. Very cool. And again, the reason why they want consumers to choose those and not the business is businesses are biased, right? Whereas consumers are going to be a little bit more impartial. Absolutely. Well, consumers can be biased too, but that's a whole other Well, yeah, 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 yeah. But, um, but yeah, businesses are going to, you know, definitely check off all of them, right? Absolutely. Um, so they want as many of those attributes as they we have can a cozy, get. We have a cozy studio here, right? Exactly. <laughs> you do. You do look like you have a cozy studio. All right. So, so uh, number five point five, and and we do want to be respectful of your time. Um, uh, briefly, uh, if you could give me uh, one point, we have I wanted to unpack is literally uh, watching review signals and and looking at how to interact with reviews that come through. What are your recommendations on that? And how do you think that actually applies to local optimization? Yeah, so reviews are definitely a rank. First of all, they're a ranking factor. So mm -hmm. you want to get as many reviews as possible, but you also want to make sure that they're natural reviews. So Absolutely. for instance, you don't want to do a mass mailing to 250 of your clients and say, please leave us a review because that would be a natural do Google. Yeah. <laughs> Google would see that and they would, they would flag that and probably say, this is kind of shady. We don't trust this. Right. So you want to do it naturally. First of all, the other thing is you want to respond to reviews, whether or not they're good or bad. Mm -hmm. um, and then you also want to, if it's a good review, click on the little thumbs up like button, right? because the more likes you get, it bumps up those five-star reviews towards the top of the list Very and good. can bump down the negative reviews. Now, the other thing is just because you get a bad review mm -hmm. doesn't mean that it violates Google's terms of service. Sure. So, you know, we have a lot of business owners that come on and say, this is a, you know, a review that needs to be taken down and we'll look at it and say, no, you're just not happy with the review because it's a one-star review. Right, you know, right. it doesn't violate it. So, you know, just know that Google will very rarely take down um, a negative mm. review unless it's from like an ex-employee or right. one of your current employees or something like that, and, and people can prove it. So you kind of really have to prove that it does violate terms gotcha. of service before they will remove it. Now, what about the speed of response uh, to those reviews as they come in? Does a simple thank you as quickly as that review comes in help you? Yeah, as soon as you can. Um, I'm of the mindset that Google watches all that stuff. So, for instance, messaging, which is an option for businesses mm -hmm. to get messages from their customer. I've heard things that Google watches that, that they watch how fast a, a business responds to messages. And I think that's one of the reasons why Google took messaging from using, you know, general SMS and have now brought that into the Google My Business platform right. is so that they can track 
how fast a business responds to text messages. So I'm of the mindset that they do track those types of things and that it help, I'm thinking it helps with rankings okay. so that if you're a very responsive business and answer the phone right away and respond to text messages and respond to reviews, I think that helps you in rankings. Okay. So yeah, if you can keep track, you do get notifications when you get a review. So the sooner you can respond to that review, the better. Excellent tip. Excellent tip. Point six, briefly, I, I, I may actually want to combine these two. Um, well, it's, it's photos. There's been a yep. lot of hubbub about photos, and uh, according to Google's own data, businesses with photos receiving for, receive 42% more requests for driving directions to their location from users on Google and 35% more click-throughs to their websites than businesses that don't have photos. Now, there are some guideline issues that have been out there, and, and Google is actually hammering down on the use of stock photos. <coughs> Pardon me. And... <laughs> oh, I'm overclamped. <laughs> and on top of it, um, uh, way too salesy or promotional photos. So right. can you give us your, your thoughts on, on how that affects uh, 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 optimization of a local property? Yeah, I mean, why would you want to show a stock photo on your Google My Business profile? So Google wants to see what your business is about. Right. They don't want to see a generic person on a stock photo. They want to see team photos. They want to see the exterior of your business. They mm -hmm. want to see the interior of your business. They want to see a sign that shows that your business is legit. You know, they want to see pictures of you, your team doing um, activities like volunteer activities. They want to see a Christmas party pictures. Sure. You know, they want to see pictures of your products and services. Um, don't use stock photos, guys. It's it's not worth it. Yep. Now, um, there are instances lately where, for instance, photos may not show up. So, you know, I have a client right now that spent money on getting photos taken mm -hmm. of their staff. And for some reason, those photos aren't showing up. So I need to contact Google and have them manually push those photos to make sure they're displayed. Mm -hmm. So there are glitches that sometimes happen, but you want to make sure that you're putting only photos that pertain to your business. And you also okay. need to, to, to watch the photos because a, a consumer can put any photos they want to on your business. So that's yeah. part of it is manning that. We still get a picture every once in a while on one of our clients that somebody's taking a picture of their apartment, their, their car via their apartment window, and it keeps on coming back. And it's like, all right, this has nothing to do with them whatsoever. What in the world's going on? So you do have to be vigilant, especially whenever you have nonprofit organizations or schools that you need to, to make sure you're watching what's coming through uh, right. on a regular basis. Yeah? Right. Yeah. And you definitely want to flag those. So for instance, if there's a photo that is not pertaining to your business, you want to go into your GMB pro, your GMB dashboard and yep. flag it from within the dashboard. And then, you know, like you said, Aaron, back to making sure your data, nothing has gotten changed. Mm -hmm. For instance, um, one of our high schools here, they had their oh. website changed into a porn site. And it stayed oh. like that for 48 hours. You know, the kids were all talking about it, my kids included. Oh um, but the school didn't realize it was changed until about 48 hours later. So you always want to go in and check to make sure that your business's information right. wasn't changed by some user edit. So Jeez. always check that. Yeah, definitely. Oh God, that's terrible. All yeah. right. So last on the list of uh, points I wanted to bring up, and, and we, we uh, kind of uh, went through this offline before the show, was uh, the QA section. Uh, the QA section, the purpose of that QA section is to give search users and local cu cu customers additional information about your business outside of the, the uh, attributes, outside of the business and the user-generated at attributes. This is a, a way to gain additional traction with your consumers mm -hmm. and, and really gives the, uh, the business owner the ability to unpack a lot more of understanding of, of the services that they provide. So right. is that a good thing uh, from an optimization standpoint that uh, users should be uh, executing on on a regular basis? Right. I don't think it impacts optimization per se, okay. but it does help. So for instance, um, if you can preempt some of those questions, mm -hmm. that's a good thing. So as of right now, Google will let a business owner go in, ask a question, and answer a question. Whether or not Google's going to let businesses continue to do that, right. we don't know. They may put a stop to that and say, 
businesses can't ask and answer their own questions. But right now you still can do that. So what I generally tell customers to do is talk to their salespeople, Mm -hmm. talk to the customer support people and find out what do people ask about our company, our products or services when they call in or when you talk to them and then make a list and go in and ask that question and then answer that question. And then again, thumbs up, you know, those questions and answers so that they get, yep. So they get those, those likes. Now, the other thing is going back to posts, Google has started to use posts, the content of the posts to, to try and see if the posts answer any questions that people ask. Huh. So for instance, if you go in and ask, start asking a question um, on an attorney's site about, you know, do you do um, divorce cases, it, it will start showing frequent or late, po- you know, one of your later posts, and it will show anything that has the word divorce in it, and it will show that. And so, you know, that's where kind of using those keywords in posts can be helpful because they start showing in answers. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of weird what they're doing. So I'm not sure how that's all going to play out either, but that's why maybe using keywords and posts is helpful because, or maybe answering questions in posts is a good idea too, because they can help answer in the Q and a. So if that makes sense, it does make sense. And thank you for doubling back around on that because I did jump over that. The post production and, and, and the posts and events and, and offers, all those are also using what, uh, what uh, GMB provides you as tools, and it certainly should be seen as an additional opportunity to, to create more and more value on the platform, let alone yep. possible uh, optimization. All right. The best part about all this is that Google My Business <clears throat> or lo- has incredible local support. Um, they've got the Google My Business Help community that you're a part of. Uh, they got the Google My Business listing spam report, they have the fake review report, and they also have phone, chat, and email support. Can you yeah. uh, give us a, a, a quick picture of how responsive uh, the Google local uh, side of things has been? Yeah, so the local forum, the Google support, Google My Business Support Help Forum, um, the volunteers there are awesome. Mm-hmm. And generally, we're able to get in there and answer questions, you know, within a day or so. We can't always fix the problem because yeah. we're not Google. And sometimes we do just need to say you need to contact support. Yep. Google My Business Support is not always the best uh, in getting back with you quickly. And sometimes, depending on who you talk to, you unfortunately may even get the wrong advice. Oh my. I per- yeah, I prefer using Twitter. I've had better luck using Twitter. And then sometimes if you're tweeting and just tag Google, um, Google my biz, mm-hmm. they will even respond to you because, you know, they're um, scanning right. for their, te- for their, um, for their um, at sign. And so, Sometimes you'll get a response faster that way as well because you kind of called them out publicly, <laughs> which is not necessarily a good thing to shame them publicly, but sometimes that helps as well. Yeah, as long as it's an innocent question that, that yeah. could possibly help their help audience. others. Absolutely. Yeah, All exactly. right. So we just went through a gauntlet there, seven points of some optimization. Anything, I know there's a bunch that we probably left off the table, but any final thought on the GMB side that our listeners should know about? Yeah, I think one thing you want to be aware of is that suspensions, chances are during some point in time, your listing is going to get suspended. Hmm. So start brushing up on what to do if you get suspended. A tip is do not make a bunch of changes at one time to your listing. Okay. So make a change, walk away, you know, and then make another change. So if you make a bunch of changes at one time, that can trigger a suspension. So that's kind of my little tip of the day. Absolutely. Well, we certainly appreciate that. Sherry, uh, we do appreciate your time today. There's a lot of information that we packed into this hour. Um, I hope you enjoyed it on unpacking all this Loved with it. us. We always, we always like, you ha- like to have you on the show, and you're always a wealth of information. Uh, I always ask this of our, of our guests. What bugs you right now about your industry? What bugs me about my industry? I forgot you asked me this question. Um, SEO services cost. (laughs) Yeah, I know. So I guess what bugs me about the industry right now is, well, this has always been a problem. I think 
and it has to do with customers. I, I still don't think customers realize the value of what a search engine professional optimization professional does. Okay. And so, I mean, I still get a lot of calls from people who say they want help with their optimization and I see that they need help, right. but they're not willing to pay my fees. Right. You know what I mean? And so there's an assumption me, that just gr grabbing a hold of the GMB all of a sudden uh, gets them going to is going to get them in the ranking of the three pack, right? right? Yeah, exactly. No, you know, but it's much but it's much more than that. I mean, um, there's a lot of people that just think that, that that's all they have to do is Google my business and they're going to automatically rank. Right. And that's, you know, if that's your whole business strategy, business marketing strategy, you're, you're going to fail because there's a whole other, you know, there's a whole bunch of other things you need to do yep. that can't be your whole strategy. Absolutely. Well, conversely, what excites you about your industry uh, right now? Um, I think right now, um, just that everything is constantly changing. I mean, it's one of the industries that I love the industry because nothing stays the same and um, you're constantly having to be on your toes mm -hmm. and keep up with what's going on. And for me, that's what I've loved about it for the, you know, the past 21 years. 21 years, guys. All right. Hey, that's that's how it, how long it takes sometimes if you fully yeah. plugged in. Um, thank you again uh, for your time today. Uh, is there something that we can pro promote for you right now? I know we, you're going to be on the uh, Midwest Digital Marketing Conference here coming up, but uh, is there anything else that we can promote for you? No, nope, nope. Just go ahead and um, if you have any questions, you go go ahead and tweet me at Sherry Benelli and hook up with me on LinkedIn if you're interested in learning more about what I do. Absolutely. So on Twitter, at Sherry Bonelli, B-O-N-E-L-L-I, on Facebook, Early Bird Digital Marketing, and LinkedIn, Sherry Bonelli. Um, thank you so much for your time today. Thank we you. want to make sure that our audience checks out the news portion of the show because we did a deep dive in a number of these local issues. And uh, don't forget to like and subscribe edgeofthewebradio.com if, you if you're on YouTube make sure you hit that bell so you can get reminded when we go live and if you're feeling it up, feeling up to it today give us a review online uh, as opposed to offline yeah, so there's that. Go over to iTunes and, and the different aggregators and let us know how we're doing in that space. Be sure to check out all the must-see videos and much, much more over at edgeoftheradio.com. That's edgeoftheradio.com. Hey, check out that NAP uh, checker, edgeoftheweberadio.com forward slash NAP. Be able to test out your your NAP and see how well you're organized out there. Uh, next week, we're going to be talking to Chuck Fields, and we're going to be talking about podcast SEO. So from here on out, we got some great shows. Uh, be sure to check all the lineup of everybody that we're going to be talking to. Uh, we'll talk to you next week. Thanks to all the crew at Site Strategics and Edge of the Web. Uh, we will, as well as SMX, we really do appreciate going out there last week and being part of that show. From all of us over at Edge of the Web, thanks so much, and do not be a piece of cyber driftwood. Take care.